listening to God's Word for us that come. Ghana's online Christian station. Be blessed as you listen to messages on the site. Amen. We can clap again. I understand we couldn't sell our books in the first service, maybe. But this time around, it's 30 Ghana cities. This book will change your life, The Power of Servanthood. It's about my ministry and some of the things I've gone through and the blessings God has shown me and the key to serve God and be successful. Can I hear amen? amen? Can I please ask you to stand wherever you are? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Let's stand. And now, therefore, O oh God, do that which you promised. We have come to receive new marching orders, revelation, that we may serve you better in the future than we did in the past. This afternoon, let your oil come over me again. Let me speak as an instrument sent from heaven and in blessing that your people may be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand and be seated. Amen. amen. Let's go to Psalm 107, verse 14. Psalm 107, verse 14. And 15, let's see what the word of God says. Psalm 107. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men will give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. If I were you, I'll clap. This morning, I want us to address the big issue. Why we must give thanks to God? Why we must give thanks to God? I'm bringing you a very firm empirical position. Put the matter to rest permanently. After today's teaching, there will be no argument about the issue or whether or not I should give God thanks because we want to exercise the ghost of this issue permanently, make you understand that you must give thanks to God. Can I hear amen? But why is thanksgiving a problem? Now, I want to, I want to caution you. Thanksgiving is a life and death issue. If you want to serve God in peace, and live long. You must understand the purpose of thanksgiving. It can kill you. It can terminate your life. It can lead to premature death in ways you may not appreciate. And so listen carefully to me. One winter night in 1860, a ship, a steamboat, a ship broke up and sank in Lake, Lake Michigan. I've flown across it. There were 393 passengers aboard the ship called Lady Elgin. 279 people drowned. Of the 114 survivors, 17 were saved. The 17 were saved by a young man called Edward Spencer, a student of Northwestern University. Spencer wanted to grow and become a preacher of the gospel. He was an expert swimmer and lived along the beach and saw the boat sank, the ship. Edward Spencer swam and saved 17 people in the time of winter and freezing weather. 17 trips. By the time it was through, he suffered from hypothermia. 
cold, fatigue, and delirious. He went into delirium. He never became a minister of God because after that night, he was sick and he was confined to a wheelchair and he saved 17 people. Many years later, as he sat in a wheelchair on his birthday, an editor came and asked Spencer, what do you remember that night? Edward Spencer sat down quietly and after much contemplation, he answered, I remember that not one of the 17 people returned to thank me. Not one of the 17 people he saved for which he became a cripple. Not one came back to say thank you. What is it about man that creates ingratitude? Let's get into the word. Ingratitude to man is ingratitude to God. Write it in your notebook. No man can show you mercy. No man can show you any kindness without divine motivation. Nobody owes you a free lunch. Ingratitude to man. Sometimes you say, you see God? Why should I thank you? You see God? Is it not God who blesses us? The person who paid your school fees when you were going to school, your first shoe you wore, somebody bought it. Now that you have graduated, you just found out your father is a wizard. Now that you have become a minister of state, a political leader, you just found out your wife cannot speak good English. I'm going to know now your wife by short. You just found out. Now you need a new wife who can produce the queen's English. This woman who paid your way to school. When you are investing, and I've heard this since I've grown up. I'm not a small boy. I'm no spring chicken. I've been around here for a while. I've heard stories. People say, and I paid for that young boy when he was in Legon. And when he completed school, he found out I'm a seamstress. But I paid his way to school. Life is full of stories of ingratitude. And what we do to men, we take to God at great cost. Ingratitude to man is ingratitude to God. It is not happy people who are thankful. It is thankful people who are happy. Hear this. Hear this well. Unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. Write it down. Unexpressed. Unexpressed gratitude is ingratitude. Your father, your mother, your pastor, even to God. Can't you see? I, I appreciate it. What is the magic formula? Open your mouth. Say thank you. When my wife cooks a good meal, I said, thank you. So, oh, it's all right. I said, it's not all right. I said, thank you. Okay, 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 okay. For some people, it's difficult to say thank you. It is difficult. And you are going to be shocked by what you find in the scripture. It can destroy marriages. It destroys relationships. can destroy your relationship with your boss. This is Christmas. Some of you don't even know where your father is. You don't remember when you last called your mother. She sold all her clothing to take you to school. Now you're a big woman. When she calls you, you say wrong number. 
Look at someone and ask, are you the one he's talking about? No response. I don't want you to get a red eye. But let's look at the word of God. Someone should be clapping this morning. So, in the light of the word of God, the word of God makes it evidently clear that thanksgiving and church has to do with maturity. That the reason many people don't thank God is because in the scheme of things, they don't understand where it is. And Paul wrote a letter to the Philippian church. And the Philippian church was a church he loved dearly. If you read Acts chapter 16, that is the church he nearly died and ended up in prison, you know, on the road to Macedonia. And so the Philippian church was unlike the church in Corinth. Ladies and gentlemen, we find eight things about a mature Christian. So when you know Radim, now we do Radia. Eight things about a mature Christian. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Here we go. All roads lead to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. It's in the New Testament. I don't want to waste your time. Philippians chapter 1. Eight marks of a mature Christian. Hey, I am a mature Christian. I'm going to put you to the edge of the sword. You're a mature Christian. Let's find out. Let's come to brass tacks. Let's find out. Number one. The first mark of a mature Christian. One. Philippians 1, 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. The first mark of a mature Christian is a thankful heart. A didawano. I did that one. No. Every time you open your mouth, you are thanking God for something. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for my husband. I thank God for my son. I thank God for this. You are a thankful person. You are not an ingrate. Some people are ingrates. She, people have a term that I grew up hearing and I really dread it. They say, Boniaye Kai Debi. And girls have a word which is very difficult to use. It's deeper than this. Which means ingrate, ungrateful person, remember a time past. Because a key say, a tea may refrain. All too soon, you become managing director, you become big pastor, you become Mrs. So so and so, big woman. And you forget where you come from. It's a dangerous situation to be in. The first mark of a mature Christian is a thankful heart. May God help you to be a thankful person. There are people, every day they are complaining about something and I can't stand them. They are complaining. Bad weather. They are, when it's rain, they complain. When it's a matan, you don't know what they are looking for. Traffic, they complain. On a day where there's no traffic, they complain. So we, we don't know what to do with them. When you live with them, it, it's a torture. Plain it in terms of problem. A delay, so and talk. The first mark of a mature, thankful person. May God make you a thankful person. I say, may God make you a thankful person. You were on Achia Mountains the other day. You stayed there and naturalized. Finally, when you came down, God gave you a husband. Now everybody is hearing your marriage problem. My husband is not good. I have a bad one. Are you not happy you have a bad husband? Somebody doesn't even have a bad one. Everybody in the church knows your problem. And the people you are talking to, their own is worse than your own. And they are not telling you. Who doesn't have a problem? Everybody know your problem. You are telling me. The other day somebody was telling me something. He talk, 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 talk. I let him run out of steam. I said, you know what? If I put my own here, you will collapse. He said, okay. He said, okay, I won't tell you again. <laughs> I said, if I give you one quarter of what mine is, you will freeze. Number two, the second mark of a matured Christian is consistent prayer life. Philippians 1 4. 
always in every prayer of mine. You cannot be a mature Christian when you are anti-prayer. Every time they declare fasting, you go underground. You will travel to China by force. A true fasting you will disappear. You hate fasting and prayer. My thing, your thing has come. Every time it's prayer, in January, prayer and fasting is coming. We'll hear you crowing all over town. Crowing. My thing. Me, I don't have anything. You have a thing. The drum power, I know what the number. You alone have something. Thank God I don't have it. Look at someone else. Do you have a thing? Every time there's prayer and fasting, your thing will come. Uh, Pastor, can you give me an excuse? My thing has come. Third mark of a mature Christian, a life and a heart full of joy. Philippians 1, 4b, a heart and a life full of joy. Hallelujah. Amen. Making requests for you with joy. Joy is infectious. When people come around you, they should sense joy. Bishop James, I tell people, you can't put me down. I, I, I am an excited person. I am not going to live forever. Whilst I'm here, I'm enjoying myself. I'm happy. I, it's a decision I've taken. I am happy. I'm happy. When the day I was consecrated bishop, I was given a warning by one of the bishops. said, you, you are very exuberant. Now that you are bishop, you have to cool off. I said, it's not possible. It's too late. I said, no. When, when I was growing up, that was the problem. Every time they take me out, my father must control me. Because I can't sit down quiet. So even when I'm taking a picture, I have a problem. I can't keep my hands down. If, and it's my problem. So when my, my wife, when we go out, she'll be monitoring me. So if, if I'm sitting somewhere, she'll eye me. Sit down quiet. Because, <laughs> because that's how I've grown. My son too is like that. If I sit there a little, I feel like standing up. I want to go somewhere. <laughs> I can't sit quiet. And I enjoy life. You should be a joyful person. Don't go around as if you have been baptized in acid. Nothing makes you happy. I have never seen you smile. What kind of thing is that? If you are not happy as an unbeliever, if you are born again, we've got to see your teeth. The mark of a mature, you are joyful. And people want to come around you. It isn't that when they see you coming. Hey, bye. Because the moment you come, the lights go off. Every time you open your mouth, negative. Either you are telling lies, you are gossiping. And so once they see you, the meeting close. May God make you a joyful person. Can I hear amen? And, and for you young ladies, men want exciting women. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every time he comes home from work, try to tell you the trouble. You, they are going to sack you. You. you, you men, men want women who give them encouragement. Could you, it will be fine. I am praying for you. Could you? I really love you. Can't you see it? You know, I bet you he will give you all his money. <laughs> I don't know about that. Philippians 1 5. The fourth mark of a mature Christian is a strong fellowship with other believers. You don't have a holier than thou attitude. Some Christians have attitude. They think they are the only children of God. So everybody else, they are finding fault with everybody. Super holiness union. Number five, confidence in God's salvation. Philippians 1 6. You believe that God who saved you will take you to heaven. That we are on our way. Can I hear amen? Philippians, now, the sixth mark of a mature Christian is partnership with other believers. Philippians chapter 1, 7 to 9. Let's move it. Number 7, 
the seven mark of a matured Christian, growing discerning love. Philippians 1, 9 to 10. Growing discerning love. Growing discerning love. And that's important for modern charismatics. These days, there are all kinds of prophets. All kinds of colors. Of all sizes and shapes. Anointing oil has over 20 colors. The other day, I was listening to radio, and I heard people giving loto numbers. I had a shock. Pastors giving loto numbers out. That's how far we have come. And I tell people, if the numbers were working, the guy shouldn't be giving it out. And they were very brisk, shouting, sweating, and giving numbers, and people were calling. Growing, discerning love. You can discern between right and wrong. And finally, number eight, the eighth mark of a matured Christian is a life of righteousness. And let's read the verse 11. Be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which is what John the Baptist spoke about. That you should grow in righteousness. You shall bear fruit worthy of repentance. If you are born again, we should see the fruit. When you are unbeliever, you had one girlfriend. Now that you are born again, you have three. So uh, what, what, what is it? Are you growing in sin? No. A life of righteousness. The Lord help you to live a life of righteousness. Give the Lord a hand if you believe that. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't appreciate that. Do it again. Do it again. Now, let's get into deeper waters. Lift up your hands, Bishop. Preach. One more time. For the last time. I've been in the Lord almost 40 years. And, and one of the questions that bothered me until now was, why did God bring them out of Egypt and kill them? Because at one point, Moses told them, told God, if you wipe these people out, the people in the neighborhood, you think you took them out, and you are not capable of taking them to the land. But the more you search the word, the Bible says they turn their glory to shame. And I'm going to give you a shock of your life. It will change your mind. And the issue of thanksgiving will become a premium issue in your life. You will not take it lightly. Three million people, only two entered the promised land. Why? 430 years in captivity. And you are going to be shocked at what I found out. Let's get into the word. Write down a few things for me. It's a life-saving measure. Write it down. Write it down. A long pencil is better than is better than a short memory. A short pencil is better than a long memory. Write it down. A short pencil is better than a long memory. Let's look at it. What state? Give me a wave. Let me catch you alive. What was the state in which the children of Israel were when God took them out? And yeah, when we're changing the period of freedom. What were they in? Now, if Egypt was like the promised land, then God should leave them where they were. We are going to settle some difficult questions. If being single is the same as being married, then God should leave you as a single. You don't need to pray. If single room without window and you have to come out for fresh air, is the same as living in Trasaco. Then God should leave you where you are. But the point is that, let's agree that God took them from a, a poor place to a better place. Oh, goodness. Let's look at it. Let's check the scriptures. What state were they in? Exodus chapter 1. I built a principle. Let's test drive it. Exodus. Say Exodus, chapter 1, and shout amen. Now, we are going to look at the resume or the track record of these 3 million people and what the problem they had with God was. Exodus, chapter 1, look at a collection of words from verse 12. 
But the more they afflicted them. Affliction is not a positive word. Throw a notebook. Affliction. Just what it is. You are under pressure. Affliction. You can't sleep. You are all kinds of pressures. You can't think right. Something is not right. Affliction. That's the first word. Then he says, verse 13. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. We are Juma Friano Pakosi and Yumre. They serve with rigor. No rest. Next verse. We are looking at and they made their lives bitter. No, assemble all the words. Mitchell will be tro tro. For notebook tro. Rigor. Bitterness. They serve with bitter, with hard bondage. No rest. Without bond, in mortar, in brick, in all manner of service. They serve with rigor. That's what the Bible says. I'm going to give you a pleasant surprise. Some more. They serve with rigor. Can I hear amen? One more time. Let's move it. Chapter 3 of, Ex of Exodus. Follow carefully. If you follow me, you will not get missing. Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 goodness and the Lord said now this is a crucial issue the decision to take them out of Egypt into the promised land was God's decision even if they knew they were in bondage they cannot do anything can I hear amen or oh, give me a wave even if they knew I put to you even if they knew they were in bondage, there's little they can do. Chemie, se wunim se wu pe kunu kra, wu wu ni chumi a obema ungu kunu. O nyami ne beche we ni mo nyam. It is God who can give you a husband. They knew they had a problem, but they cannot unilaterally, by their own power, leave Egypt to the promised land. They didn't even know where promised land was. It's only God who knows where the man to marry you is. Let's give credit where it's due. So the Bible tells us, beyond, and the Lord said, I have surely seen your oppression. I have seen that you are single. How when it rains, you cry in the night. God said, I've seen it. He said, oh, pray. I have seen it. The young man, I've seen your oppression. That you don't even clean your room. That your jeans has not been washed for six months. I've seen your oppression. God said he has seen it. Whether the young men say amen or not doesn't matter. That your, your room is like a war zone. Fallujah or Baghdad. You have to cross leftover materials to jump on your bed. And if you are looking for something, looking for something, it takes about three days. Looking for your socks. Because one is in the garage. <laughs> I have seen. And God said he has seen it. If there's a young man, he has said, God said he has seen it. <laughs> and he will give you a good wife. <laughs> I have seen your oppression. Of the people of Israel. And heard your cry. Another word. Cry. They were crying. You know how much you cry in the night. And I know there are sorrows. Sorrow. I feel like crying. Bishop, don't cry. I've seen there are sorrow. 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 When you see, listen, when I didn't have a child, I married nine years before I had a son. My worst day in church is the day of baby dedication. My wife said she would go to church. We were in Nigeria as missionaries. Of all the days on Sunday when his baby dedication, I don't feel like going to church. Because Nigeria is not like Ghana. Baby is a big issue. Ghana, we are very light hearted about it. Nigeria is no joke. Hey, they have a way they see you. And when his baby dedication, they'll carry about two or three and deposit on me. I should carry them perchance God will show me mercy. 
near the back of the motorway. They put one on my back, they put one on my shoulder, and I'm carrying them. It isn't that I'm taking them home. Oh. Carry them, they wee wee on me, and I smile at them. Then after five minutes, the parents will come. Time out. God saw all that. God saw all that. God saw all that. Whatever you are going through right now, as on the day of Thanksgiving, may the Lord give you an answer. In the name of Jesus. He said, I am come down to deliver them. Let's look at it. There's a missing link. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And look at the word. For, I'm teaching for a reason. He said, I am come down to bring them out of that land unto a good land and large. God is taking them from the bad to the good. A land flowing with milk and honey. The place, God is going to remove some people to put them there. Replacement by displacement. Let's go to the next verse. Now, so we've seen, now let me read you one more. Exodus chapter 6 verse 9. I'm working it out very carefully. 6, 9. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit. Their problem has assumed their spiritual nature. Anguish of spirit. Anguish of spirit. It's so bad, you sit down there, hmm. then they ask you, are you have any problem? He said, nothing. Sometimes three days you will not eat. Wedding day is your day of pain. Baby dedication, you can't handle it. Anguish of spirit for their cruel bondage. Cruel bondage. A situation you can't come out. So we see from Exodus 1, 12, 19, 3, 7, 8, 6, 9, the collection of problems, afflicted, rigor, hard labor, oppression, they are crying, they are tears, anguish of spirit, cruelty, bondage, slavery. God took them out. Let's see their response. You think in a situation like this, this were going to be a thankful people. A thankful people. A thankful people. Let's read the scripture. Exodus. Let's go to Exodus 14, 12. And then you are going to, I'm going to make it look out for your own life. Look at it in your own life. Is this not, hey, is this not the word that we told you, Moses? Moses, I told you. They are sounding like modern Guineans. We told you, Moses. You catch them. Me to me baby no be worry me. Hey. If I didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't come to marry me, I would have been with my brother in America. Your brother. <laughs> your brother. But I thought your brother knew you were here and didn't come for you. Until I came and married you. And now the woman is crowing. If if this this bad marriage I'm in. Be careful what you say with your mouth when you get into crisis. Because your mouth can create problems for you with God. Look at what the Bible says. Look at what the Bible says. Give me that scripture. Let's wipe it out. Is it not the word? When was my catcher? I worry away. This is what I told you. Moses, we told you. We wanted to stay here. You said a certain God. Now you see, I was better when I was a single. I had more food to eat before I married you. And you know it's a lie. If you didn't come to marry me, my brother would have taken me to America. And you used to tell me your brother sleeps under a bridge. Your brother, how can I say America or the bridge? I say well, Florida. Your <laughs> brother, on your man. Now say cry Trump or chain or the neighbor. This brother you are talking about was arrested by Trump. It was our prayer that saved him there. Now you say you want to go there. And when you have a husband, instead of thanking God, this is the thing we told you. He said, Is it not the word we told you? So sometimes 
people so soon forget the slavery, the bondage they are in. The Moses, the deliverer has become their headache. So we told you. That some people even when you convert them to Christ and they face a problem, they blame you. That people have led to Christ, they face a problem. Say, when I was one believer, I was even better. You want you have some crying in life, you better change. Say, I sorry, I didn't buy problems. So they are making Egypt look better. Let me show you other scriptures. Give the Lord a big hand, please. <laughs> Who is not clapping? Exodus 16 verse 3. So now, and the children of Israel said, oh, that we had died in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Be careful about that thing in front of your face. Be careful about your mouth. Your biggest problem in life is your mouth. Some people, when they get angry, they are unstoppable. I wish this marriage break. Are you sure? Marriage with three children. How you suffer to get a husband. You want the marriage break. If God grants it, are you sure that's what you want? This useless job. Graduate unemployment. And what you have, you say it's a useless job. They went on and on. Oh, that we are died in the land. Uh, now, give me a wave, everybody. Look at someone say, shine your eyes. Look at what they said. When we sat, <laughs> this is a bunch of jokers. When we sat by pots of meat and ate bread to the full. Or truffle. Liars. Shame on them. I thought we just saw slavery and rigor. Now, overnight, they are telling Moses, they ate pots of meat. Grilled chicken. Slave. Since when did a slave eat restaurant food? Pots of meat. And we had bread for the food. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill us with hunger. You were already a hungry person before I came for you. Now my goodness has become my headache. You are, you are going to be in for a bigger shock. Hmm. Look at the next scripture. Oh, someone shout amen. amen. Come on, I didn't hear you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 4, verse 6. Give me Numbers 4, 6. So what is their response to what God did for them? Numbers chapter 4, verse 6. Now the mixed multitude yielded Where are we? Yeah, Numbers. Can I hear amen? Can I? Now give me Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. Good. Go where I'm going. Good. Now the mixed multitude that yielded to intense craving. So they wept. Who will give us meat to eat? Go, move on. Move on. Let, let me work it out. We remember. I think I should sort this out. Now give me a wave. Now, by the way, a little warning. What we are reading there is the statement of former slaves. We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt through our force. The cucumbers. Yeah. Onipanye. <laughs> hey. At ye may refrain. <laughs> Good times make people forget. It's like a dream. I'm not sure what I'm seeing. The fish we ate freely. That sounds like restaurant. The cucumbers. The melons. Oh, come on, boys. The leeks. The onion. The garlic. <laughs> hey. Hey. You mean, now, if they were eating this, why did God take them out? If you were not crying in the night when you were single, why did, I, why did God give you a husband? If childlessness was okay for you, why did God give you children? 
If living in a single room without windows, windowless room, that when you open your window, you are into another man's bedroom. That if you open the window, you can hear all the ongoings. You can hear everything, nothing hidden. In a cry here, and God took you to a better place. And said, they were eating leeks. Some of the things I've not eaten before. Onions and garlic. I mean, you are talking about specially crafted cuisine. So, what was their problem? I'm going to give you another shock. Give the Lord a big hand. Oh, come alive, come alive, come alive. Come alive. Amen. 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 They sat by pots of meat. They said they had bread to the full. Give me numbers 11. Let, let's wrap it up. So, onions, leeks. Go to the conclusion of that verse. Go to verse 6. Verse 6. I'm wrapping up on that. Verse 6. Verse 6 of Numbers 11. There's no verse 6. No, but the guy can't go there. But now, our whole bean is dried up. Now, it's going to get nasty here. There is nothing at all to eat except this manna before our eyes. And remember, the manna is angel food. They cross the red line. If they are just talking about garlic and others, God won't mind. But the food God provided. Look at, look at your head. Insulting the miracle baby. Look at your head. I, I, I was listening to a certain story. I think it was a comedian. Somebody was saying, those who live around Trasaku, uh, big guys, when they insult their children, they don't insult them negatively. He said, look at your head like Bill Gates. <laughs> he, said, he said, it's poor people who use negative insults. But those who live in poor, prim and proper areas, look at your head like Donald Trump. I think that one is not a very... <laughs> I don't, I think, let, let's, no, we live in a virtual age, the social media. That one is also a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Let's agree that what, that's what I said. Do we agree that's what I said? Give the Lord a big hand, that's what I said. <laughs> oh, look at his head like Obama. Then it means your child can become a president. But if you live in, like in the countryside, so look at his head like a witch. <laughs> And it was a comedy I was looking at. I just fell off my seat. He said, rich people insult others with other richer people. There's four folks who go down the rain. But I declare if you're a child of God, that's not what it is. Give the Lord a hand, that's not what it is. Amen. Let me give you one more scripture. And then we turn the corner. So now, we see what the state they were in. And then we also see their response. Now, this is the dangerous one. Numbers 14, 1 to 4. I will not read that. Now, I think, let's go there, let's go there, let's go there. Give me Numbers 14, 1 to 4, quickly. Quickly, quickly. I'm about to descend. Numbers 4, 14. Quickly. Am I going to work with it? Numbers 14. Numbers 14, 4 to 6. Sorry, Numbers 14, 1 to 4. Good. 1 to 4. Good. Good. So the congregation lifted up their voice and wept that night. For what? Next. My God. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and the whole congregation. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we have died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to fall by the sword? That our wives and our children become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Are you saying, instead of thanking God, you are saying your life as an unbeliever was better. You want to go back and become an unbeliever. You want to go back and become a Muslim, become an idol worshiper. Is that what you are telling God for what he has done? It's going to get dangerous. Verse 5 and 6, and I'm done on that part. Quickly, move it. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Verse 6, and I changed direction. But Joshua, among them, tore his clothes. 
Go with me to the last major verse. Number 16, 13. This, this one is where the time meets the road. Look at it. Now, this one is the one that broke the camel's back. This is the scripture that really had the spillover effect. This is the scripture that I'm sure closed the door to the promised land. Wait, Debbie, you can't do this. Look at it. Is it a small thing? This is the children of Israel out of captivity. We've seen rigor, slavery, trouble, calamity, bondage, pain, sleeplessness, slavery, and all that. Now, is it a small thing that you have brought us out? Listen. You have brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey. Egypt. They changed the word of God. Now they say Egypt is the land flowing with milk of honey. One no, one no, one no problem. Your mouth can stop you from entering your promise. Heaven you will go, but here you have a problem. He said, a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness. So now, they have made God a big liar. God says Egypt is a place of slavery. The promised land is a land flowing with milk and honey. But this ingrate, Boniaya Fowey, they say Egypt is rather the land flowing with milk and honey. And God said, that is the last one. He said, I swear by myself, only Caleb and Joshua shall enter the promised land. All your children will enter the land you despised. Listen. All your children that you bring forth, they shall enter, but you, you will go through the wilderness 40 years until you all perish. Only two entered out of three million. Begin to examine your life. And be careful what you say. They change their glory into shame. Psalm 106, read it. Plus, they made Moses to speak unadvisedly. They rebelled. They spoke against God. They denied the blessing of God. Look at your life today. Are you not better than many people? Can't you find one thing to thank God? Look at your life. Yeah, the clapping is coming. Now you are getting the message. Go to Kolebu right now. You are talking about a year. Your, your salary didn't come. You didn't get promotion. The husband didn't come. Your prayer was not answered. But I dare you, it's better than lying in Kolebu with your feet in hands. Escafoe would seek a seat anywhere. People had accident and broke all the upper teeth. Filthy rich when they spoke. Blah, 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 blah. Note it. Note it. They have money they cannot eat. Rich people in the mock, much when they pull them out, some armed robber is lying on top of the rich man. Go to the merchant. You will change your mind. Rich people naked. Do you know who I am? Who are you? The people who are somebody, they don't introduce themselves. We know them. The moment you say, I don't know who you are, then you are nobody. Because those who really are somebody, they don't ask. Margaret Thatcher said, when you say you're a lady, then you are not a lady. Because ladies don't say it. You can see it. For some, for some of you listening to me, you are too much for yourself. You don't understand the mechanism of life. You don't greet people. You don't get people greet you, you don't even respond. You, you can't shake somebody's hand. I said, go to the merchant. Rich people. 
I'm robber under them, prostitute on top. What are you talking about? Life is not the way you see it. Every day you must learn to live humble and give thanks to God. If you read Psalm 106, he said, People who don't live a thankful life, they are reckless. That's why when people become rich, that's why money is very dangerous. If you are not ready, the quickest way to kill your enemy is to give him money he cannot handle. The quickest way to hang somebody you hate, give him so much money, he will kill himself. And you will not be part of it. People get so rich when the driver is driving and somebody crosses them. Oh, hit him, kill him, I'll pay. I've heard that. I mean, the, the, the way they drive on the road, just drive recklessly. And sometimes they come down. I've met cases. I usually, when I don't come out of my car, there was one case, a circle. The man came out, throwing tantrums like a spoiled child. Came out with a huge agbada. And my driver went out, they were arguing. He said, do you, know, do you know who I am? Do you know I can buy your car? He's referring to me, my car. And I was inside listening. Do you know I can buy your car? See my car, see your car. And I recognized the guy, a very rich guy, born again. Oh. He was born again. And go for it to a man, Joe BNB. Born again, three tantrums. And he had some bling bling. He was wearing some bling bling. And I think he just came from Germany with his trousers towards his chest. Now, Dumapa or Chira were all throwing them through, throwing his leg, saying, I, I think I've got to go and live abroad. I said, Now, who cares? <laughs> Man, I, I, I'm happy here. And I came out. Bishop. <laughs> he said, Bishop, please. I didn't know you are the one. So I said, Come here. Let me give you a little tutorial. You don't do this. I know you're a very rich Christian, but you disgrace the kingdom here. Yeah, yes, sir. It was your fault. You crossed the driver. It was your fault. He knelt down and said, Yes. I said, You don't need that. I can't stand it. I, I'm not like that. But I'm telling you. You didn't represent God well. People are watching you. They know you. Humble yourself. If you want to live long, when you are wrong, accept it. I said, Bishop James, I kneel down before my wife when I'm wrong. It doesn't affect my anointing. My family. I said, my dear, I'm sorry. Have you forgiven? He said, yes. Sometimes she's so embarrassed. I mean, I don't care. A small boy, you, you, like, if I offend you, I can say I'm sorry. If I must kneel down, kneel down, my life will go on. Submission profits the submitter. She, I will brass it, do be quite I will brass it. Humility. You see, and, and I read that the reason many people don't give thanks to God, they are not humble. It's too much for them to come and stand here and say the success was from somebody. They want us to know. They earned their own degree. They studied themselves. Their brain was their own. Humility is the evidence. I mean, appreciation and thanksgiving is an evidence of a humble heart. It's difficult for some people to say, I am sorry. Thank you. They can't. God is too big for them. But out of this message, they, it killed them. They died. They said Egypt was a land flowing with milk and honey. It made God a liar. And God cannot take it. Look at your life. See where God has taken you from. Maybe you don't have everything you need. But you are better than what you used to be. I meet friends today. 
and they are flattered by what God has done for me. I had a friend Abbas, and I'm closing with that. I had a friend Abbas. I went to the airport, and he saw me. He said, James, when I was an unbeliever, I used to be called King James. That's my guy name. Achimota Nenye Ize. Achimota. I love. I used to. I used to go to dance. I love dancing, and I wore my guarantee shoe. You young guys think you've seen the anything. Our days was the real days. Oh, no shutter movement. I'm talking about the real days. And my friend saw me, Muslim. He saw me with my new car. He said, James, is that your car? I said, yes. See, God has blessed you. I said, yes, of course. Come to church. He said, can I take a picture? I said, you can hide under it. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand, amen. He said, yes. my son that nine years before you were born married so be careful live a thankful life the other day I took my son to Frafraha orphanage Kwame he's 29 now he's a lawyer 29 but I took him to Frafraha orphanage when he was about 14 my wife asked me who I'm taking I said I'm taking you to the orphanage he said for what I said for a learning curve I said, education is not only in classroom. This boy needs this. I took him there. And we got there. We saw children, water running out of their nose. They were encircling me and holding me. Daddy, daddy. Then my son, 40 years, asked, Daddy, where are these children? I said, orphans. I said, where is the father? I said, ask Adam. <laughs> I said, where is their mother? I said, their mothers are somewhere. I said, what? He said, what are they doing? I said, they are here. Their father and mother have run away. He said, why? I said, Kwame, if I must answer, then you need a whole Bible school. Because this problem here is Adam. Up to today, and it hasn't changed. It's, it's a problem bigger than you. <laughs> so, but understand that life is not... So I said, Kwame, listen. Not everybody sits in a car to school. Not everybody eats in a dining hall. You have never sat in a taxi in your life. You go to school with a driver. You travel abroad every holiday. You know many parts of the world by 16. That is not the way the life is every for everybody. You may grow with a sense of entitlement, thinking everybody is like you. No. You must understand there are children like this who don't have father and mother and don't have the Bennett face you have. So when you see them, don't think something is wrong with them. He started crying. You see, yes, man, he was crying. I was crying. And the children were all around us. He had $100 in his pocket. He said, Daddy, can I give them? I said, yes. When we were going, they were following us. He said, he asked me, can he take some home? I said, let's go and ask your mother. <laughs> yeah, coming out, five children following me. How do I answer for that? It's going to be quite complicated. Uh, I who uh, here. Uh, so I can come and help, let them stay here. But carrying them home is a different gospel. And he has not forgotten. Every year, we take food there. Joe will tell you. Next week, we'll be there for, for our orphanage. When I go there, I thank God. I said, I could, my son could have been one of them. I said, I myself could be any of them. When you see somebody poorer than you, it could be you who was there. Yeah. Who chose that you should be here and the person should be there? And once you understand that, your chemistry change. That life, you don't look down on people. Don't stop the clapping. I'm closing. Come on, come on, come on. Don't stop, don't stop. Bounce them. And I close with this. Every time I eat and I throw food away, I cry. I'm a very light-hearted person. Every time I eat and I throw food away, I cry. Because somebody doesn't have food. If you want to know Thanksgiving, watch TV. See Somalia. The land that ISIS occupied. Yemen, Syria. And see the migrants traveling on the Mediterranean to Lampedusa in dingy boats 
with pregnant wives and children. Who told you you are better than them? Who told you? Who put them in Yemen and put you here? What part did you take in that decision? It is God who determines the habitations of men. So who will be only be no pun and tear she ye? When I'm best sorry at here. My conclusion. Every time people did their thanksgiving, it multiplied their blessing. Hannah had one son, went to church in Shiloh, did thanksgiving. In the end, he had five more children. Thanksgiving is a key to multiplication. Finally, 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. David, Nathan told him, he told Nathan, I want to build a temple for God because the ark of the Lord had always been in tabernacle and tents. And God told him, no. God was excited about David building him a temple. He turned God on. Because until then, nobody had ever mentioned to God that you build a house for God. And God told David, you're a man of blood. I won't let you do it. Your son will do it. But just by your, your, the appreciation for what I've done for you, nine brothers, you were the one I chose. When the prophet came, you were not in the house. But I chose you. By what you decide to do, David, you will not build me a house. I will build you a greater house. And God gave David a dynasty. 400 years, David's descendants sat on the throne. Solomon was one of the greatest. And here this finally. I gave a story in the first service. Thank you, Lord. There was a man who had an only child, only son. The son grew very bright, brilliant guy. Top class. Cream de la cream. First among equals, smart boy. So the father took him to school. Had multiple MBAs. Went to some of the best schools. Worked with some of the major corporate institutions. I mean, he was a boy going places. In his mid-30s, he occupied a top job in Europe. By this time, his father was in his 80s to 90s. Old man, weak and frail. But the boy never allowed the father to come to Europe to visit him. He married, had a son, about 12 years. Finally agreed that grandpa should come and visit them in Europe. Grandpa, in his elements, happy, he's going to visit his son for the first time. He went to Europe. And, and, and this young man's son, 12 years, loved grandpa. Because grandpa and grandma spoiled their children. Loved him. Was all over him. Running grandpa, grandpa, everywhere grandpa. But there was a little problem. Every time they went to the dining table. You know this boy, prim and proper, attended good schools. His teeth are crossed and eyes are dotted. Prim. The cutlery will be shaking in the old man's hand. Food will be falling from his mouth. There will be tears in his eyes for no reason. Sometimes you just cry for nothing. He was old. You know, these days when I see old people, I look at them carefully. Because that's where I'm going. When, when I see old people, <laughs> in the past, I didn't used to care. If you're a woman, hey, maybe a woman, get away, let me pass. But now I don't do that. When I see old men, particularly older ones, I go, I say, how did you get old? <laughs> Is there a secret set? I do this, I jump five times a day. I sit on bicycle, I say, okay, then I go and get myself a bicycle. Because I also want to grow. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand, amen. <laughs> but on a more serious note, as we wrap up, as they sat at table one day, the young man said, it's too much. Father, that's grandpa, I'm going to take you to the old people's home. My bro. And I do soup. We say shaky, the food is falling. You are embarrassment to my friends. The next morning, true to his word, he packed old man's things in a certain bag. Old man sat at the back crying. The son sat at the front, watching the whole scenario unfold. The father drove about six kilometers to an old people's home, put the old man there. 
paid and told them, everything you want about my father, I'll pay. And my phone call away. He drove back. On the way, the boy said, Dad! Say, yes, my son. Are you going to Disney this year? He said, Daddy, it's not about Disney. He said, Dad! Um, and the father said, is it about your bicycle? You want a new one? He said, Dad, it's not about bicycle. Oh, my son, what is it? You know, prim and proper. It's good that he has a way clear to show you. Yeah, my son. And the boy said, Dad, I want to thank you very much. He said, for what, my son? He said, Dad, I now know where to take you when you are old. Children don't lie. They don't lie. Dad, I want to thank you. I didn't know. But I want to thank you that now I know. When you are old like grandpa, where you took grandpa is where I will take you. He screeched to a halt as if he's seen a rattlesnake. He stopped. He said, what did you say? He said, Dad, where you took grandpa? I didn't know the place. But when you are old, I will take you there. The young man turned the car around, went and collected the old man. For the whole six hour, uh, three, kilo, six kilometers, nobody spoke. Grandpa was quiet, the boy was quiet, daddy was quiet. From that day, nobody spoke about sending anybody away. Obia Dinilayim. If you don't give thanks and show appreciation, we may take you where you don't want. But what you sow, you reap by your head. Onim nye ye mami. Onuna onim nye ye mawo. Onuna dofo nyamina onim nye ye. Onim nye ye ma. Ajin kwe nyamye dofo nyamye. Wuna wini nye ye. Let's sing it one more time. Hallelujah. your hand, beloved. In the first service, I gave a hundred dollar bill and I signed the check again for the same amount. Because everywhere there's a thanksgiving, it's an opportunity for me to give thanks to God. There's nobody in my family who is a preacher. Nobody's as blessed as God has blessed me. I'm a first generation preacher. I've survived this turbulence in the air of unimaginable proportion where the pilot was headed for a crash and he said he didn't know where we were and we landed. It is a miracle. I've been through accidents. I've seen challenges. I can recount many things. Whenever I see my son after nearly 40 years of marriage and born as a miracle, I thank God. If God gave me many, I'll be happy. But I'm happy for the one. Because that's what God gave me. If you can't thank God for what you have, you have no right to ask for more. Hear me well. There was a man who to me in Danasia. We need to say who was on your baby before. You haven't thanked God for what is in your mouth. You are still asking for more. You are an ingrate. Today, you want to look at your life. I said, Father, I thank you. I thank you for my husband. I thank you for my wife. If not at all, I thank you that I'm alive. I'm not blind. I'm not deaf. 
I thank you. I have a place to go. I have people who love me. Every time I see people under a bridge, I thank you that I have friends. I have a church and a pastor who watches over me. I thank you I'm not mad. I'm not better than the mad people. You think they like to eat from the refuse dump? Or but then for officer or penisa. They woke up one day, they were crazy. You think that's what they want? You think that's what they want? They don't even know they are crazy. A child saw a mad person and said, Da, da, she a rasta. I see a bottom, I was a rasta. Because he knows he's mad. You think somebody wants to be crazy? Today, I want you to take an envelope. I said, Bishop, I'll give a thousand. I'll give two thousand. I'll give five hundred. Maybe if Sir James gave five hundred, I also give five hundred. I want to give two hundred. But I want to look at something and thank God. So God will make me. Now, now, give me a wave. Can I give them my testimony? What? And a close. Can I? Can I? No, you didn't invite me, so you can't say yes. Can I? Now listen. I have my car outside there. It's a Land Cruiser, almost new. I needed a car, and I'm telling you about the power of God. I needed a car. My car broke down. A Ford Premium. I prayed for someone who bought it. Big car, beautiful. But I've used it seven years. It was weak. They said I should buy a motherboard. Fifteen thousand. I bought it. They said new engine. I said no. I didn't have money. The car was in the garage for about a week, two weeks. I was looking for the money. It was difficult. Not that I can't cover, but I thought that was not in my priority of interest. So I used the smaller car, and I had a back problem. So I was having problem. I said, God, you've got to deal with this issue. So I declared a fast. Within the first day, a friend called me and said, Bishop, can you come to my office? When I went, I saw a brand new saloon car. Almost new. He said, God said I should give you. But I lost. My, my, it's my life. My big car, premium Ford, that I've broken down. So I took the car. And he said, oh, somebody, even though I've given you the car, somebody want to buy it for 35,000 Ghana CD which immediately pays for my fault. I took the car home. I was going to call the guy. God said, take the car and go and give this person. I said, God, working with God is not that easy. He said, I said, go and give the car to that pastor. I said, God, but I need the money. He said, I didn't question. I went and gave the car to the pastor. I fasted one week. I asked Pastor Joe. They went to Abokobi. Four boys, they were fasting. I was also praying. I really need an answer to the problem. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, a friend called me from London. He said, I can't sleep. God is speaking to me about you. Do you have a problem? I said, no problem. You are in London, I'm here. I don't have a problem. Thursday, he called against, ah, something is troubling me. There's a problem. I, can, I even told my wife, tomorrow I'm coming down to Ghana. I said, for what? He said, God said I should come. When I come, I'll see you. Friday night, he called me the airport. He has arrived. Saturday, he said I should come to his house. I said, no. I'm doing a prayer meeting. I'm having a retreat, so I can't come. Sunday, he called. He said, I'm holidaying. Come and meet me. When I went, he put his hand into his pocket, put the key down, a almost brand new four-wheel uh, V8. He said, God spoke to me in London. Go to Accra and give that car in your garage to my servant. <laughs> if you don't believe God is real, this should change your life. I put my friend on the phone. I said, my prayer warriors are at Abokobi. I said, come back. The car has arrived. <laughs> I shared this testimony to give glory to God. That Bishop James, I have something to thank God for. I may not have the money to buy that car. My friend, Monday, flew back to London. He said, my job is done. He changed the documents. Monday, he was on the plane. He said, I came to do what God told me. My job is done. It was then I told him my prayer warriors were praying. Then I said, you heard from God. I want God to do a miracle for you. Stand up with me. So, you have heard testimony, but this is an incredible one. When I told my bishop, he shook. He was shocked. He was shocked. He was shocked at the enormity of the testimony. Lift up your hand. Anything you need, God has it. If you just do the right thing, can I have some envelopes? Anything you want to give. But I want you to, I'm going to put my money here. 
This is no ordinary money. This is Bishop James. Joshua may be the brother of Moses, but their hands are not the same. Moses was young, I said. Joshua received wisdom because Moses laid hands on him. I can be eating with you, but our hands are not the same. Can somebody lift up your hand? I want somebody to walk out here. Come and take an envelope. 100, 50, 200, 300. You want to give a thanksgiving offering to God and put it on Bishop James' offering and see what God will do. Walk out. Keep coming. Can I get 50 people? Come and collect the envelope from my hand. There are problems if you face today, you look for money. Share. Man, your boni aye. You are alive. Many are dead. You know friends who are dead. Unam fufu anu asha so. Afia si bebre wuko. Hundred, two hundred, five hundred. Two envelopes. You can bring it back. Or give it to somebody. Your wife. You share it. What right. do you do? Oh, da. I gave you two. Da. Okay. Thank you. Keep clapping, keep clapping. You want God to give you a miracle like that? You must be a thanksgiving person. God will look at your heart. Five children for Hannah, a big house for David. Keep coming. Keep coming. I need more envelopes. More envelopes. More envelopes. More envelopes. I will surprise you. What do you to me, to me, in Onya me, Grandma, so yeah, you are, yeah, Keep coming, keep coming. Hey, dog. dog. How are you? God bless you. Keep coming. And bring the envelope to the front. God will surprise you. God will surprise you. Bring the envelope. I'm waiting. Put it on top. You want to see a miracle. You want to see a sign. Bring it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Put it down. Put it on my envelope. God will give you a sign. God will show you a wonder. If you did it for me, he can do it for you. Somebody can give you a house, give you a land. If you only be able to give thanks, can you give thanks? Let's clap for the last time as they come. Keep coming. 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 Keep coming.
Everyone stand up. We are celebrating the 30th wedding anniversary of the servant of God. I've been married 38 years. I married before I became born again. And I, I almost 40 years of marriage. Marriage is a very delicate and difficult institution. You need great grace. And every time you see someone who is married 20 years, 30 years, you must respect them. Particularly if they are in ministry. Ministry affects marriage. Marriage affects ministry in ways you may never know. Lift up your hand as we pray for the servant of God and his wife. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Can all of you stretch forth your hands to them? Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Father, I bow my knees. When you call a man, you give him every necessary grace, resource, equipment, enablement, mantles and witness to fulfill your assignment. Today, we join our oil we join our anointing. We join our multitude of grace. And pray into the life of your servant. His marriage and his ministry. We ask, oh God, that you will strengthen him with might and power in the inner man. In the name of Jesus. Lamentations chapter 3. To subvert a man in his cause. And to turn aside the justice due a man. In the presence of the Lord. The Lord does not permit it. I decree today. No man shall take what God has given you. In the name of Jesus. Your marriage shall stand the test of time. In the name of Jesus. Wherever anyone take your name to. The name of your wife and your children. For subversion. For malice. For witchcraft, divination, and enchantment. May God exchange fire for fire. In the name of Jesus. In the same way your life has blessed millions. Across the nations of the earth. May God renew his word to you. That he who called you shall watch over you jealously. In the name of Jesus. I declare that the older you get. The stronger you will become. Because of a supernatural infusion of the power of God within your being. In the name of Jesus. May you live long and prosper. May you see many good days. May testimonies flow out of your life. Out of Zion may the strength of God appear upon your life. I declare as you enter a new future in your marriage and ministry. May gifts you never operated. Gift of prophecy, healing and deliverance permeate your ministry. And may those who look at you say, we have never seen Pastor Steve like this. I bless you that even if you pass through the valley of Baca, you would appear before God in Zion. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe you've been blessed by this sermon. For inquiries, please call plus 233 267-6055 plus 233-267-6055 or send an email to info at godswordforus.com info at godswordforus.com yeah.